Let's pray. Father, thank you again for a beautiful day today. Thank you for how awesome you are. When the sun rose this morning, you were still on the throne. When it, as it set tonight, you're still there. I thank you that you'll be here tomorrow and the next day. And there is nothing that changes the fact of who you are. And we just rest in that truth tonight. We thank you for it. Father, we lift our leaders of this nation up to you tonight. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. I ask that your hand be upon them. I ask that your mercy be extended. I ask, God, that they have an encounter with you like we have prayed for every other leader. In Jesus' name, that they see you, that you reveal yourself to them. I pray. And we give you praise for it all. Father, I ask you tonight to anoint me to preach and teach this word tonight. I pray, God, I come against any other thought or attitude that would try to hinder us or steal from us the truth of your word tonight. I thank you that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it will divide asunder between soul and spirit. And that we will receive tonight the engrafted word of God into our beings tonight. I pray let God arise and his enemies be scattered. God, help us to devour the things that are trying to devour us, we pray. Teach us, show us, reveal this to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a good day. If you have your Bibles, get them out or devices. We're going to start with our um, key verse for this series. This series is... Uh, we call it the Virtue Series for Wednesday night. We started last week talking about virtue, and we started with uh, one of the things I'm going to do, uh, I don't know, maybe six or seven topics on virtue or elements of virtue. And so the, the verse that we started with, and we'll start with it again tonight, will be in Second uh, Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, reads this way. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Remember talking about that Sunday? I had everybody quote after me that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everybody say, has given. It's, it's past. He has given it to us that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith virtue. That's where we started the series from, this phrase right here. Add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. And I want to stop right there because we're going to, we're going to be on virtue for the next several weeks. But he says to add to our faith. And so last week we talked about that, that, that uh, we can't just settle with the fact of, okay, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to go to heaven someday. That's great. How many know that is great? You believe in Jesus. You've accepted the fact that he died on the cross. He's your Savior. He's forgiven you of your sins. You receive that gift of salvation. But Peter goes ahead and writes here and says you need all this stuff that he's already given to you. This is how you accomplish it. And you need to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And we'll keep going uh, at the end tonight if we get that far. But so we, we, we started there. So last week, the topic or the, the, the one type of virtue that we added to our faith or talked about adding to our faith was honor. We need to add honor to our faith. How many know you can believe in Jesus and be saved all day long, but you still need to honor? We still need to honor authority. <laughs> great day. We still need to honor our father and mother. Above all, we need to honor God in all that we do. Amen. 
How do we do that? We honor them. We respect them. We honor their position. We don't honor deeds. We honor the position that they have. Uh, wives are to honor or respect their husbands. How many know we're the bride of Christ? And then we talked about last week about virtue. Anytime I've heard the word virtue, or when I think about virtue, I think about the Proverbs 31 woman because she was a virtuous woman. But how many know the whole thing about Proverbs is not talking about a literal wife to her husband only? It is type and shadow of the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. We all, male and female, there is no male and female when it comes to Christ. In Christ, there is none. We are all the bride of Christ. And so we can read Proverbs 31 about a virtuous woman and who she is and what she does and how she prepares and how she honors and the things that make her a virtuous woman and say, that's what I need to be. Amen? And Peter comes along and says, you can do every bit of that. It's all been given to you. And I'm going to show you how to do it. Peter said that. I'm going to show you. Peter's showing you. And I'm just reading what Peter says. And I'm going to go through these verses. Okay? So we okay? So I want to start with a verse tonight. Uh, I want to talk about greatness. About being great. That's not the, the, the one. Number one was honor. Tonight we're going to talk about another word in a minute. But Matthew chapter 23 verses 11 and 12. It says, But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Short verse. We've all heard it. Most people can quote this, and I want to talk about this tonight, and we're going to go deep, so... Stay with me for like three hours, and we will get through my notes. I promise. All right? And I'm not, I'm kind of not joking. There is coffee in the back. There's decaf in the green room, and there's caffeinated in the kitchen. I have caffeinated. I've already had a half a cup. I'm ready to go. I'm serious. Because why? Because God dealt with us and dealt with this church in the beginning of the year about it's time to execute. It's time we get off our little pity patty hind ends as Christians and this flaky, bakey junk stuff and pretending to be something, and we need to be something. Amen? There's a difference of acting like something and being something. And we talked about that last week, about somebody that has talent or ability or they, they, they just are gifted at something. They don't have to act like it. They don't even have to brag about it or wear a T-shirt that says so. Amen? They can execute without an execute T-shirt. These aren't for everybody else to see. These are to remind us when we look in the mirror. Come on, somebody. Because my Bible says that if you humble yourself, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal the White House. Oh, dear Jesus. Amen. And so... I want to talk about, about greatness because there's something about when you talk about being great and, and being awesome or being good at something. Like we use the phrase, we've been using the phrase killing it. That's not killing it like, man, I'm killing it. I'm great. No, I'm, I'm killing some stuff. I'm laying aside. We come, we come, uh, that comes from the verse out of uh, uh, Hebrews uh, where it says, let us lay aside the weight and sin that does so easily beset us. That's the stuff I want to kill. I want to kill the stuff in my life that so easily besets me, the weights, the, whatever weight that is, the thought processes, the things I've allowed in my life, the relationships. I want that stuff aside away from me, and I want to quit the sin, the mark missing, because I want to accomplish what he has for me. It's time for us to execute as the church, and I'm telling you, I saw some video stuff today that I almost threw up, and I don't even want to talk about it because we're online. I'll talk about it when we shut it off, but... Uh, it's time the church be the real church instead of some of this hyper pimp my ride stuff. Amen. It's time we get real and the rubber meets the road with some stuff. And so that's, that's all I'm after. Amen. You tell your neighbor, I should be great. Tell them, I should be great. I should be. Amen. And hopefully by the end of the night, you'll start believing that you are and why you are. And I'm going to show you how to get there. Amen. There's some kind of a disconnect between godliness and greatness. 
although they should be considered to be the same characteristics of a Christian. Just like godliness with contentment is great gain. I know a lot of people that are godly, but they have absolutely no patience. I, was, I went to point, and it just come back. And <laughs> Honesty tonight. Okay. But it seems to be this disconnect with so many about godliness and greatness. They, they, people get nervous, you know, because it's like, it's just like I said about the T-shirts or, or us saying, killing it. I'm killing it. There's a difference in society's version of stuff and God's version of stuff. And that's what we're going to get into tonight. Just like the deal of being great. God wants us to be great. How many honestly believe that God wants you to be great? Not just good. We've had enough of people trying to be good. What we need are somebody to be great, not act great, not fake it great, not look great, but be great. Amen? So godliness and greatness need to go together, and they should. But how can that be? I'll quote Elton Trueblood. I posted this, I think, last week. Deliberate mediocrity is sin. Deliberate mediocrity is a sin, and I believe that. Because when you are deliberately just settle for mediocrity, just settle for good enough, just settle for kinda or half, half butt doing stuff, I mean, you like people to work for you that halfway do a job? Do you like to have somebody work on your vehicle or you hire somebody to do a job and they halfway do it? How would you feel if you were God and you created somebody and you put all kinds of stuff and greatness in them and you put your own spirit in them and they said, eh, that's good enough. How insulting. It is so insulting to God when we just settle for, for, for just mediocrity and just kind of. And just waiting for him to come and rescue us. When he said, I've given all power and authority was given to Jesus. And when he left, he said, I'm giving it to you. I'm leaving my peace with you. I'm, I'm giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will empower you to do and handle and accomplish everything in your life by my spirit. I'm putting it in you. Don't settle for mediocrity. Amen? That's not cocky. That's not arrogant. There should be a difference. And this is what has frustrated me so much with the church world. When you get just get on a, a statistic website and you look at the, the, the statistics of Christians versus non-Christians, you can't even hardly find the difference. Why would you get dressed up and go to church on Sunday and give an offerings and do the stuff and do Christianese talk and all that kind of stuff and worry about what people think and say if you're going to live the same life they do? There should be a difference, and that bothers me, and it has always bothered me, and I have been to both ends of this. I have been burned out. I have been, forget it, I'll just enjoy the ride. I, I can't do anything anyway. I've been, I've been bitter. I've been mad. I've been hurt. I've been lied about. I've been cheated on. Uh, whatever it is that there is, not by my wife, by the way. But it's happened, amen? But that's no excuse. Psalms chapter 48. Why do I say you should be great? Because he is. Great is a characteristic of God. Great is a characteristic of God. Psalms 48, verse 1 and 2. Can you, not 12. Sorry. It's all right. My version, or my, I wrote it down. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord and he's greatly to be praised. And I've already, I mean, there's a whole other message right there if we just do it. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain, in his holy mountain. Stay there with verse 1. Think about this with me for a minute. Who's the city of God? What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? He said, you are a city set on a hill. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in, everybody say in, in the city of our God, you are the city of God. In his holy mountain, he should be greatly praised in you and I. Go ahead, next verse. Beautiful in elevation. That means he should be great. We should, we should elevate him. We should, be, we should be elevated. We should be noticed. We should stick out from the crowd. We should be different than everybody else. Not in a prideful and an arrogant way. Not a haughty way. But there should be something different about believers than the world. Amen? Please stay with me. The joy of the whole earth 
is Mount Zion, which means praise, on the sides of the north, the city of our great king. There used to be a, a, a chorus we sang when I was growing up about this. But you are the city set on a hill. Jesus said that. <clears throat> you and I need to get it in our mind. Jesus, he, he said uh, about a mountain, he said, you can say to this mountain, be ye cast into the sea. Any mountain that does not, a mountain that exalts God or where God is exalted, we need to cast it into the sea. Amen? I believe we are called to be great. Our praise should flow from our revelation of His greatness. Because great is our God, and He's greatly to be praised. So when I see people that don't praise God, I'm talking in a, in a literal service, or I'm talking people that just don't praise God in their everyday life. I don't think they have a praise problem anymore. I think they have a revelation problem. They don't see God as great. Because how many know when you see something great, you automatically praise it? How many have watched videos of people that do freaky great things? Like those guys that ride bikes off of these cliffs and they're, they're just diving off these mountains that you wouldn't even think about trying to walk down. And they just go airborne on a bicycle. And land on a little track. And they're just zigging down there. And they'll flip and go up in the air sideways. And they'll do all this stuff. I mean, you can't help but go, wow. That is awesome. Why? Because it's great. Amen? It's better than normal. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's above uh, normal, right? So people that do or have a praise problem really don't have a praise problem. They have a perception problem. Their perception of God is not great. And if their perception of God is not good and He's great and He's awesome, they have trouble praising. It's like, well, why should I praise God? I mean, I've had a bad week. My car broke down. You know, my, my motor blew up in our car today, literally. That's fact. Does that change who He is? I praise Him anyway. When I found out today, I said, well, praise the Lord. We're getting a new engine or a new car. And the exciting part is, I don't know how in the world He's going to do it. So now I'm full of anticipation. I guarantee he will. Because my, my Bible says, my God shall supply all my needs. So it's like, cool. Right? How could you be down or depressed when you live like that? That's what sets you apart. And some people may say, well, you're weird. No, I'm not weird. You watch what happens. Amen? We've been to this movie over and over in our life. It looked like everything was bad. Something may have been bad that happened. So what? Watch God. Watch what he does. And so people that don't praise have a perception problem. Are we okay? Great is our God, and he's greatly to be praised. You can't praise right when you don't see him right. You can't praise right when you're seeing him wrong. And just because something doesn't happen the way we think it should happen doesn't change the fact that he's great. Just because an, uh, an outcome of a situation didn't come the way we thought it or somebody prophesied it or whatever it is doesn't mean that God's done anything different. God's still absolutely great. Amen? So when we see him correctly, you can't help but praise him. You can't help but praise him greatly. You see people come in here. Uh, there, was, there was a particular time we had a lady come here for a while. And worship would start, and she'd just come down front, and she'd get on her knees on the floor, and she'd just weep and wail and worship. And everybody would come to me after church, and it's like, what is that woman doing? Did you see that woman? I don't think she needs to do that. This is several years ago. And I said, do you know her story? Well, no, but that's just... I even, and she used to go to other churches, and I've had people from other churches. They found out she was coming here, and they said, that woman come to your church? I said, yeah. They said, she go down front during worship? I said, uh-huh. And they just look at me like they're waiting. And I just wait them out. And they're like, well, I don't think she needs to do that. And I said, well, that's really not for you to worry about, is it? I said, do you know her story? No. How many know Jesus said, he that's been forgiven much can love much? She had just come through a major health issue in her life and a journey, and God had healed her and restored her and put her back. She couldn't help but praise because her perception of God was, oh, my goodness, look how awesome he is. I shouldn't be here today. I shouldn't even be alive today. And he's restored my health. He's restored my marriage. He's restored my happiness, my joy, my peace. I can't help but praise him. Doesn't that sound familiar? When David said, when I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, I... 
dance, 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 dance. Is that a Kirk Franklin song? Somebody does. I mean, we need an organ up here. Do the one-legged Holy Ghost dance across the front. We're like, look at them crazy people. No, you don't know what they've been set free from. You don't know what God's delivered. You don't know what's happened to them. That's why they greatly praise God because he's done so much in their life. Amen? But even one step further than that, he's just great whether he did anything or not. Amen? He was great before I decided he was great. It's kind of like people with talent and ability. We talked about the Tillman guy, and I'm going to bring it back up later tonight. He was already good. He didn't have to prove anything to anybody. Amen? Whenever we see something great, we say, wow, or we tell them. Uh, um, we tell everybody how great it was, how great that person is, how great that artwork was, how great their talent was, how great that thing was, how great that experience was, how great the food was. Anybody ever told anybody about a good restaurant? Did you have trouble explaining how good it was other than you were just excited and you were like, and it was just so good? And, this, and the rolls, I mean, they throw the rolls at you. And you catch them, and they're, and they're just warm, and you put the butter on them, and it just melts. It's just so good. What if we describe God like that? We would if our perception of him was that way. Amen? People that have a praise problem don't have a praise problem. They have a perception problem. Are we okay so far? It's automatic, right? Intuitively, it is in you and I, we have the ability to respond to greatness. There's just something about us. We like greatness. Amen? I think God made us that way, so we'd like him. It's in our, it is our perception of what is great. Um, whether it's food, cars, shows, voices, you can have uh, or experience someone or something that is the greatest you have ever experienced, and you tell everybody about it, and that's great, but how many know that's the best you've ever seen until you see something better? Amen. That's what I love about God. He just keeps one-upping himself. He's so great. And about the time I think, man, you are awesome. I mean, you can't beat that one, God. One of my favorite stories is, is Robert Morris, the, the pastor down in Texas, when he started trying to outgive God. If you've ever heard his testimony, he's told this for a true story. He tried to outgive God. And one day he just kept giving more. He'd given cars and stuff. And one day he finally said, you know what, I'm going to beat him. And he reared back and gave his house away, his car away, and all the furniture. He reared back in his chair, and he folded his arms, and he said, gotcha. And he said, my phone rang. I answered the phone. The guy said, are you so-and-so? Yeah. He said, uh, the Lord dealt with me. He said, I have a jet, and uh, I'm supposed to fly you for the next, I think it was a year or two years, and I'm supplying you. I'm giving you the jet. I'm supplying a pilot and all the fuel for you to travel. The Lord told me you're going to travel. He said, I stuttered and said, okay, and I hung up the phone, leaned back in my chair, and he said, the Holy Spirit said, gotcha. <laughs> How many would like to live so boldly and so, so confident in him and what he did that if he told you to give your house, your car, and all your stuff away, you'd just say, no problem. We live so far beneath our privilege as Christians and believers. It's not that you have to be weird. You just need to understand how great he is, and it won't be weird anymore. Amen? It'll be weird to people who don't understand him. It's our perception of what is great until you experience something greater. Can we go down this path for a minute <laughs> or an hour and a half? So when a person is not properly praising or responding to God's greatness, it has to be because their perception to how great he is is wrong. Greatness from a biblical perspective is not wrong. It is not bad. It is not a vice. It is not self-serving. And it is not idolatry. For you and I to be great, it is not bad. It is not a vice. It is not self-serving. It is not idolatry. Greatness is a virtue. Add to your faith virtue. Greatness is a virtue, just like honor was last week. Biblically, this does not only describe God, but it is a word that describes what God wants to do in and for his people. You say, prove it to me with Scripture. Thank you. Genesis chapter 12. Our father of faith is who? Abraham. Abraham is where the faith whole thing started. He, we call him our father of faith. What did God tell Abraham he was going to do to him? He said, I will make who? 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many know that sounds pretty great? If that's our father of faith, it's in our lineage. It's in our faith lineage to be great. It's in our faith lineage to have a good name. How many know a good name is pretty powerful? Having a good name is a whole lot better than a bad one. Having a good reputation. Why? Because God will show you how to do that. There's a method to it. God said, I will make this, but I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the method to get there. Biblically, this does not only describe God, but it is a word to describe what he wants to do in and receive you or in and through you and I. The father of our faith received that promise from God. He said, I'll make your name great. Listen to me. If you do not embrace this, what I'm teaching you tonight and what I'm trying to talk to you tonight, you will not be intentional about evolving into it. And there are people who just will not embrace this kind of thinking. They're like, oh, no, we're not supposed to be that way. You just sit here with me for a minute, and I'll bet you agree with me before it's over. If you do not embrace this kind of a think, thinking, you will never evolve into being great. You'll just settle for less. You'll just be mediocre. Mediocre. You'll just hold on till he comes. I'm just in the sweet by and by. I'll be happy someday. How many know the Bible says today? After so long a time, he told the children of Israel, while it is called today, if you'll harden not your hearts and you'll believe you could walk right into the promises of God. Peter just mentioned the whole list again, and we could live this great life. Who wants to live a great life? Greatness from a biblical perspective is not experienced automatically. Greatness from a biblical perspective is not experienced automatically. It is stepped into intentionally. Greatness from a biblical perspective is not something that you experience automatically. You can be, you can be revealed to you. Your perception of God can be great. But as far as you and I becoming great, it is stepped into intentionally. There is a difference in how greatness is seen in our culture and how greatness is seen in God's kingdom. Now I want to get into the meat and potatoes of this. There's a difference between how greatness is seen in our culture versus how greatness is seen in God's kingdom. This is the problem in everything, just like with the, the phrase killing it. When we say killing it, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, they got this cultural perception of what we mean by killing it. But in my mind, in my heart, it's I'm killing the stuff that's just messing with me. I am so sick to death of everything that has kept me from being what God called me to be. People's opinions, people's thoughts, my thoughts, my opinions, my weakness, my fears, my doubts. That's the stuff I'm aiming for this year. That's what I'm executing. Amen? I'm ready to kill some stuff. How many ready to kill some stuff? I told you I'd teach you how to hate tonight. I posted on Facebook. So I hope you all watching. I'm going to teach you how to hate. I mean, Ecclesiastes said there's a time to hate. Uh-oh. Well, it's all love and flowers. No, there's time to hate. Amen? Come on, somebody. Our culture, number one, there's two things about our culture, and it's two extremes. Tell me if this doesn't fit. There's two extremes in our culture when it comes to greatness. Number one, you are nothing until you do something great. I mean, I can see a lot of people think that way. It ain't nothing until you do something great. Then I'll call you great. Amen? And then the other part of, and this is our culture. This isn't kingdom yet. The other extreme in our culture is you are something even though you've done nothing. I mean, you know, we got a pretty big society that thinks that. I'm a winner. Really? What'd you win? Well, nothing. I'm a winner. And we laugh at them because we got these two extremes. You're either nothing until you do something or you're something even though you've never done anything. Amen? I want to talk about that for a minute. Thanks for asking. It's pretty much how it is. There's two extremes in our culture. But say this with me. Kingdom culture. We need to adopt a kingdom culture. Even though we live in this world, we are not of this world. Jesus said, I'm not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. But he, yet he told his disciples to pray that that kingdom come here like it was there. 
So evidently, he wants the kingdom culture here, and he wants us to live and operate with a kingdom culture. From God's perspective, it's not either or the two extremes that I mentioned. It's not either one of those. It's both and. You are nothing until you've done something great, and you're going to do something great. You need to do something great. You are great. I'm sorry. I did that backwards. You are great even though you've, done, you've not done anything yet. But because you're great, you will do something. Does that make sense? It's both. From God's perspective, it's not either or, it's both. Greatness of who you've been called to be causes fruitfulness in your life. You are not just a tree that looks good and has pretty leaves and all that kind of stuff. How many know you're a tree that should bear fruit? Jesus got really angry at a fig tree because it did not have fruit on it. And he cursed the fig tree and he said, you'll never produce fruit again. And we know that, that in typology and metaphorically, he's talking about the law and the old covenant with, that, with the fig leaves because the fig leaves is my self-righteousness. I'm going to cover my sin. That's what that all pictures. Remember the fig leaf joke and I sewed fig leaves on? All right. That's what he was talking about metaphorically. We understand that. But we are not to just have nice, pretty leaves on us and look good. Amen. Tell your neighbor, bear fruit. See, and then you get that, that perspective in the church. Everybody becomes fruit inspectors to see if anybody else is bearing fruit, and they forgot they're supposed to have some. Are we all right? So the closer I get to God, the more respect I have for God. Because the more I see Him, the more I understand how great He is, the closer I get, the more I realize who, how great He is, the more respect I have for Him. People should know you and I the same way. The people who know me the best respect me the most. Why? Because they know me. And they know the things I've been through. They know the things. They know the real me. They know, they know the things, the insecurities that I have, but I, and all those kinds of things. People that are closest to you should respect you the most, not because of what I do, but because of who I've become. My wife respects me probably than, more than anybody else in the world. Why? Because she's seen me at my worst. She's seen how far I've come. She's seen, she's seen me throwing up on the way to church because I was going to try to lead worship the first time. And yet, I've got to be a preacher someday. I couldn't even stand up here and sing in front of somebody. I'd throw up and be sick but on the way to church. She saw me go from that to where I'm coming to church going, woo, like Toby. And she also seen me come to church depressed, thinking I ain't even saved. And then walk up here and the Holy Ghost hit and I just preach like a madman. Why does she? Because she respects the God in me more than me. But because she knows me more than anybody else, she respects me more than anybody else. Remember a couple weeks ago I talked about the difference of being versus acting. And I want people to be Christians, not act like Christians. The word hypocrite, the definition of hypocrite, means an actor on the stage of life. And everybody wants to talk about people being hypocrites. Tell your neighbor you're a hypocrite. Good news, we all are. Amen? We all fake it. Whether we like it or not, I'm going to try to teach us how to get out of that. We're going to kill some of that. How many want to kill some of that faking it? I won't kill it all. Remember, and so we talked about this. It's not the being that produces. It's the being that produces the doing. Paul said that about his faith. He said, I'll show you, I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen? I'll prove my faith because I have the works because of my faith. Not to try to, not, I don't have to try to impress anybody by what I do. I do because of what I believe. Now, because it is an evolving thing, it's not experienced automatically. We must be willing to overcome the obstacles to do it. I must be willing to overcome the obstacles to it. You can not only be great but you can accomplish great things if you're willing to overcome. What did God say that he's made us more than? Conquerors. He's made us overcomers. That means there's something to overcome, and we have the opportunity to overcome it. We can either stay here and not, or we can step on over into the promised land. 
Amen? It's always our choice. If we don't want to go into the promised land, he'll just wait 40 years till you all die off and he'll take your kids. Amen? How many have seen a generation of people that would never step into something, but their kid had to wait till they died off or they had to wait till they stepped out of the way till they could step on into it and they knew it 20 years ago. But the, dad, the, the parents or the whatever it is and whatever, pers- you know, whether it's a business, whether it's church, religion, what, a farm, whatever it is, they would not never step in on into the promises, but somebody else could see it, but they had to just wait their turn. Just like Joshua. Joshua was a kid. He grew up in the wilderness. But all of a sudden, Joshua and Caleb could see that promised land, and they went into it with a totally different perception. They went into the land to, pro- to spy out the promised land, and the other people come back, and they're like, oh, there's giants. We can't do it. And they're like, yeah, but God's great. That's really what they were saying. Because they were saying, look at the fruit. Look at this land. This is what God's been, you've been, God's been saying this to us our whole life, and it's right here. We can take them. See the difference? So you and I have a choice whether or not we want to enter into this life or not, whether we want to be great or not. We can think about it, talk about it, or we can just be it. How many want to be great? You can only be great, not only be great, but you can accomplish great things. Jesus points to the enemy of our greatness in this text. Jesus does not suggest the enemy is the enemy. This is what's wrong with church world and Christianity today. All the focus is on the devil. All the focus is about the enemy. Last time I checked, the enemy was defeated 2,000 years ago. Now, is that true or not? Did he kind of finish it or did he finish it? Cassie brought out a scripture with the women last night. Clear back in, was in Isaiah that you read that? Or Ezekiel? In Ezekiel, when he said that the enemy's been dealt with, he was prophesying the future. It's finished, it's over. He was prophesying about Jesus and what Jesus would do. Either Jesus defeated the devil or he just halfway did it. How many think he halfway did it? I don't think he halfway did it. Jesus don't halfway do nothing. Amen? So he points to the the greatest enemy of our greatness, and it's not the enemy. But he does say this. Watch this. He said, the greatest among you shall be, not act like, shall be your servant. Everybody say be. The greatest among you shall be a servant. Okay? He connects greatness to the being. Not acting. Greatness to being. He said the greatest among you will be your servant. He shows you how to identify greatness. And he says the greatest among you shall be. Servant is being. Serving is doing. There's a difference. I've had people in my life who were serving, but they weren't a servant. Amen? Anybody ever had somebody like that? They act like they was working for you, but they weren't working for you. They was working for them. And if they'd have just understood, if they would just work for you, you would open doors for them that they had no idea you could open. You could, you, could, you could create opportunity as a boss or someone who owns a company for somebody working for you that they have no idea, but they're so worried about themselves or they're just working for themselves or trying to get ahead that they're going to miss the whole thing. That's exactly what we do as believers. God says, you have no idea. I can open doors for you that no man can shut. I can cause you to stop and get gas at a gas station and bump into a guy that will change your generations. If you'll just listen to me when I say pull over. Come on, somebody. That's a spirit-led life. You call that weird all you want. I'll take it. Amen? I want to hook up. I want to listen to a guy. I want to partner with God. I want to understand my perception of, of, of somebody like that to where he can just guide me and direct me unto all truth. Whatever he says, I'm just going to serve him because I know it doesn't matter. My life's good anyway. And if he wants to open a door for me, great, because it'll be a good door. Amen? And I know this, now, no one can shut it. Amen? And he'll shut doors nobody can open. He'll just shut something down sometimes. He's done it. Anybody, God ever shut a door for you? Even when you didn't like it? Now, someday you'll thank him. I've been crying and mad and bitter and yelling at him about stuff. And three years later, I was like, God, I'm sorry. 
thank you for saving my life. Is this true? All right. The greatest among you will be the servant. He counts the greatness into the being. Serving is being. Servant is being. Serving is doing. A servant is primary greatness. Serving is secondary greatness. I'm going to say it again. Servant, a servant is primary greatness. Serving is secondary greatness. How many want to be second? If you ain't first, you're last. Come on. There's a difference in being and seeming to be. Remember when we talked about acting good or being good? If somebody is good, they don't have to act. It's the principle. It's the same principle here about being and about being a servant. The greatest is the servant, not the one who serves. And you say, well, wait a minute. If you're a servant, you'll serve. That's true. But it's the servant. There are those who serve, and there are those who are servants. The greatest will be the servant, the servant, not the server. We can either be or we can seem to be. We had, um, when you've been in ministry for 20-some years, you see all kinds of things, especially with churches and, and how people come in to serve or not serve. And we've had multiple times of this, different people, and, and I can't help but think of one that they they came they 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 were in a church where we were at one time and their famous their famous quote or saying was we're just here to serve we're just here to serve and even the tone you knew it was wrong we're just here to serve we're just servants we're just here to serve we're here to work for god i'm like all right well i need you to do this and this and this okay everything was great for a little while and then it would get snide, and it would get a little, a little more bite to it. Oh, we're just kitchen help, or we're just help here. You know. Don't worry about us. You're in charge. Hmm. I am. <laughs> and they would say those things, and, and you could just pick up on the voice. And then after a while, they didn't get the recognition they wanted. Boop, they're gone. It happens. I've seen it over and over for 20 years. I, I think back to all the different churches and the people, and they would, some of them just come in like a force. It's like, yeah, we're here. I've had people tell me, I'm just here to hold your arms up, Pastor. I'm here to help you. I'm going to do this and this and this. And three weeks later, you couldn't find them. And I'm like, you prayed with me. You wept and cried with me three weeks ago, and you're gone. And I call them. They're like, oh, yeah, well, we decided to come over here and do something here because the business was better over here. I mean, you know, that's not being great. That's acting great. Primary greatness is being. Watch this with me. He lets us know how to identify greatness. He says this, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. There's that be again. There's, there's a lot to this being thing. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever humble himself shall be exalted. You can try to exalt yourself, but something will humble you. Have you ever seen somebody who always was trying to exalt themselves? And sometimes they're even successful, and then all of a sudden, God just yanked the rug out from under them. And we can't stand people that are like that, that are always cocky or arrogant or talking about what they've done, and I've done this, and I've accomplished this, and I've done that. Don't get looking at me like that. And they're saying that stuff, and then all of a sudden, wham, they get humbled. There's being humble, and then there's acting humble. There's other people who try to act humble, but they're not. And Jesus gives us a way to recognize this. When you try to exalt yourself, God will humble you. That's not a threat. It's a way to identify the actors. Come on, somebody. When you see somebody get humbled, you realize they were probably acting. It's tight, but it's right, and it hurts. 
but it's true. It's happened to me several times in my life. I remember telling people one time about, about investing money and, and how when I had convinced myself that when I would, when I would go out and, and, and buy, a, buy a piece of land, that I was really, you know, it wasn't that I was buying it to make money. I was buying it because I was going to buy it and split it up into three pieces instead of one, and then I was going to sell it, and this family was going to build a house. Well, of course, I'd build them a house. I mean, really. And I was just doing it for them. And then their kids would have these memories on this place. Wasn't I being nice? I remember telling the guy that on the phone. You're not, you're, it's not about the money. You're making dreams come true. And about six months later, I was driving down the road with my car and my kids in the back and nothing. Just making dreams come true. I wasn't making dreams come true. God went, Whoop! and I'm thankful he did. I'd have been living the lie still. It hurt. There's being humble and there's acting humble. When you exalt yourself, God will humble you. It's not a threat. It's an identification thing. But you make the decision, and I make the decision. It's always a choice. But we talked choice two, three years ago. But you make the decision to humble yourself. And if you do, God will exalt you. How many would like God to exalt you instead of you trying to promote yourself? I, I, I don't do very good at promoting myself. I usually make myself look stupid. And I, I, I remember years ago talking about Jesus. Why was it that he was always trying to hide? He'd heal somebody and do the biggest miracle of the whole city, and he'd say, don't tell anybody. Not us, man. Not the American church. Woo, we got to get a camera. Woo, zoom in on that. Shh. You know, remember when the cameras, they set them on their shoulder? That's what I was doing. They set the camera on their shoulder, and they had those big old, <laughs> I remember Cassie's dad had one of those big, when the VHS recorders come out, and it was like carrying a suitcase, a small suitcase, and you put the VHS tape in there and slam the door. You're carrying that around. He'd be carrying that all the time, Christmas and stuff. That's how it was with miracles and stuff. Signs and wonders happen in the church, but we got to get a camera on it and put it out there for everybody to see it. Why? Well, because we want to reach more people. Really? How many know Jesus would do that over and over? He'd tell people, don't say anything, and he'd secretly go do stuff, and he had 5,000 people chasing him around. All the, I mean, they'd chase him across a lake. He could, you couldn't keep the people away. If you get honest and we stay humble, you won't be able to drive the people away. You won't be able to keep the success from you. The Bible says that it'll just overtake you, the blessings of the Lord. So in our culture... Everyone is trying to exalt themselves. Think about this with me with social media. Oh, my goodness. We're online. We're trying to promote ourselves. Is it really promote ourselves, or are we really trying to reach people? You have to be honest about that. We have to be honest about that. Everybody's trying to get my page. Follow me, follow me, follow me. How many followers you got? Follow, where, are they, where are you following them? I mean, I'm old school. Where are you going? They're not going anywhere on Twitter. They're just telling you every time they fart or something. Or they have a bad <laughs> they have a bad day. It's like I'm mad about this. Well, I'm mad about this. Me too. Follow them with me. Let's follow them. Where are you gonna follow them? They're gonna take you to hell the way they're acting. The only one I know that said come and follow me that had clout was Jesus. Amen? He, but what did he say? He didn't say, come follow me, I'll make you cool. He said, come follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. It had a purpose. Come with me and we'll go fishing. Peter said, I'm already fishing. He goes, nah, you're not doing it right. Everyone's trying to exalt themselves. It's reversed in our society just like everything else is that way. We do it in the flesh. We all do it. We're guilty of it. I'm in the same boat with you all tonight. So we're being humbled. Somebody called me today and wanted to talk about politics, and I said, we ain't going down this road. I 
I said it last Sunday. Quit sending me messages. And they said, what do you think? And I said, God told me three or four weeks ago. Well, why didn't you say anything? That's exactly what they said to me in that tone. I said, what's it matter? The only thing I did is I stood on this platform, and I said, the problem is we all got our everybody getting to worshiping somebody instead of somebody. See, and that just grinds people. Well, you mean you're saying this? No, I didn't say that. Don't try to put words in my mouth. What I said is, is I believe the Lord revealed something to me, but I don't need to tell anybody. He didn't tell me to tell anybody. And I'm to the place in my life I don't have anybody to impress. I'm pressing one person. She's sitting right there. I like her to like me. The rest of y'all, I don't care if you like me or not. Amen? I'm going to get sidetracked. But in the kingdom, everybody say in the kingdom, it's different. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. What is Jesus suggesting here? Oh, my notes. I went this way, down here, and then I went back that way. Hmm. All right. That's what I did. All right. How many know that everybody likes, uh, not everyone, a lot of people like to use the word abomination, especially in Christianity. That's an abomination to God. This is an abomination to God. In Deuteronomy, it's an abomination to God. And they usually get it, God. It's God. Sounds more treacherous. Right? And then we have great division over this because one sin's way worse than this sin. And we just, we pull out these three or four or five or whatever, are our favorite ones that we don't like about somebody else's kid. Or some other preacher. And we start talking about an abomination. It's an abomination. But we are selective on that. Amen? We don't want to talk about all of them. But if you pick them out, if you just go through and pick them all out, I could give you the list, but we're going to, for the sake of time, stay with it, stay out of that list tonight, other than one word. What we pick out of Scripture is the ones we want to beat up somebody with, and we say, that's an abomination to God, and you should expect all this. Did you know pride is an abomination? What? Yeah. It's the same abomination as homosexuality. How many know there's probably more pride than there is homosexuality? Amen? Still an abomination. And I'm just going to deal with that for a little while. Is that all right? How many know God hates it? God hates pride. Pride is an abomination. The word abomination means a thing that causes disgust or hatred. What does God hate? I tell you, you can hate because God hates. And if God's great, you can be great. And if God hates, you can hate. What do you hate? You hate the things God hates. God doesn't hate anybody. He hates sin. He hates pride. Why? Because it's so destructive. And it's way deeper. Can we go deep into this for a little while? I can't see the clock. I'm going to do it anyway. If you need to go home, that's fine. Because I'm telling you, there is so much depth in this thing. I've never seen it before. God hates pride. Why? I believe it reminds him of Satan. I do believe there was a Satan. I do believe there was an enemy. And I do believe that enemy was defeated. Whether or not we believe it is whether or not we, how we live. Amen? Satan wasn't satisfied with who he was. Now stay with me because I'm going clear to Jezebel. Satan wasn't satisfied with who he was. He's number two. To God. 
No, you, there's only one other position to get, and you can't have that one. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough influence for him. I could just hear, now just, just, this is just my thought, okay? This is not biblical. This isn't, I, this, it's my theory, my, just my thought of what Satan would say back in the day before he fell. I've got more to give than this. I've got more to give than just being the worship leader. I just wrote these down. I should be over more than this. I mean, I should be doing more than this. I should be in control of more than this. I'm better than this. Stay with me. I believe there's more for me than this. I've said these. I'm an archangel, yeah, but I want to do more than that. <laughs> I may be satisfied with being an archangel, number two to God. I mean, wouldn't that be pretty cool? You just fly around whenever you want. I mean, you just <laughs> want the whole field to catch on fire or whatever. I mean, you could just wipe out an army, 300,000 people, just one fell. Whoop, see you guys. Even though I'm number two, I, I, I just think I have more than this. Pride is not even the problem. Pride is a symptom of the problem. Pride is a symptom of insecurity. Insecurity is the problem that produces the symptom of pride. When I'm insecure with what God gave me, enough will never be enough. How many know that's an insult to God? When we say, God, what you gave me is not enough. Really? The way you made me look, God's not enough. How short you made me, God. I, I'm not tall enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I don't have enough hair. I have too much hair. <laughs> when we say those things, that's our insecurity, and we're telling God that he doesn't know. It, it's... When I think about pride and the power of pride, it's a symptom of insecurity. The devil was not, or Satan, if you want to say it that way, if we're going to do the character of Satan and the whole story of Satan falling from heaven and all that, he wasn't secure enough in his position and who he was, which made him have pride. And then I begin to think, what is the only thing? How many think when you think of heaven, how many think of perfection? Everything's perfect. There's no sin. There's no evil. There's nothing. It's, it's just perfect. Angels are singing all the time. It's a constant worship service. God's on his throne. I mean, can you just imagine what heaven is like? But there's one thing that could disrupt heaven. That must be pretty powerful. What is the one thing that could, did, disrupt heaven? Pride. I think this is why God hates it. If that's what disrupted heaven, how many know it's going to disrupt earth? If pride could disrupt heaven, it can disrupt your home. If pride can disrupt heaven, it can disrupt your team. If pride can disrupt heaven, it can disrupt your friendships. If pride can disrupt heaven, it will, it will disrupt your church. 
if we're going to throw around what God hates, how many know the Bible says that God doesn't even like a proud look? I instantly went to my childhood. And I don't think I'm the only one that had a parent like that. See, we couldn't look a certain way. These kids today got it made. Man, they talk back, they mouth off, they slam doors. If I slammed a door, I'd have a broken arm. In my house, you couldn't look with an attitude. And I just begin to realize how godly that really is because God hates a proud look. What is a proud look? A proud look is an insecure and rebellious look, really. And I remember my mom and dad saying things to me, and I'd get so mad, and I knew I better not look up. Because if I look, you want me to knock that look off your face? The Bible says that he, that he hates a proud look. My parents would say, don't you look like that. How many know body language goes a long ways? And if we allow the body language, how many know it'll come out the mouth? And God knows the same thing. I may go obey what my parents told me, but if my body language showed disobedience, it was on. As if I had disobeyed. I couldn't stomp away. Even though I went to go water the chickens. Where's Dean? I walked to water the chickens like, I'm, I'm going to water the chickens. Yeah. I want to water the chickens. Tears running down my face. I still want to water the chickens. And some people might say, well, your parents were mean. No, they weren't. I had great parents. And I'm thankful for my parents. See? Because this goes, this goes clear on into Jezebel. Speaking of body language. See, because people will try to control you with their look. Come on, man. Come on, women. Tell me the truth. Can your spouse look at you and you know what is happening or fixing to happen? Did you know you can control people with a look? And just like a little child, it's amazing to me how young a baby figures out how to control a parent. With a look, a body language of some sort, whether it's screaming or crying, whether it's a pouty lip, or whether it's that little shy. My little granddaughter, Ava. She is so girly. And she'll do that little bat or eye thing. And I'm like, whatever you want. They learn that. Why? It's, it's just the way we are. But when I got to thinking about Jezebel, and I, and I was talking with a young man one time, and he said, he said have you ever noticed that, that and we're all pretty grown up in here, pretty much. Um, he said, have you ever noticed that you can get around a certain woman and all of a sudden, man, you just got feelings and they may not be that good looking, but you start having feelings. He said, that's a spirit. I said, oh, yeah, it is. And everybody always wants to tag on the, the, the lust, the sexual, the perverted side onto this Jezebel thing. You've got that Jezebel spirit and it's all about sex and it's all about this and stuff. Jezebel was not about sex. Jezebel was about control. A Jezebel spirit is not a spirit about sexual and immorality. Oh, yeah, that's included. Why? Because it's a tool to control. But the root of the whole Jezebel thing is control, and they can do it through body language. I have had people come up and confront me and say things to me, and I could tell by their body language what they were saying, even though they weren't saying it. And I knew what spirit was in there. And I'm like, well, hello, darling. I had a young man sit across from our table at our house one time. He was at our house eating. And I looked up, and I, I mean, I just seen it. And he looked at me, and he goes, don't do this now. It was a devil talking to me. Because that devil thought I was going to cast that devil out right there. And you just call this super spiritual all you want because it happened later. And he admitted it, and we talked about it. And he just looked at me, and he just got this look. And he goes, don't do this now. 
because our family was all sitting around there. There are spirits, and spirits can get attached to us. I'm not trying to go all weird and goofy on spirit, but what I'm talking about is even like the Jezebel thing. We try, people will try to control us with their looks sometimes. They don't even have to say anything. The spirit of Jezebel was not about sexuality only. It was about control. A look can send a message, a look of disdain, disappointment, con a cons condescending look. Have you ever had somebody look down on you? Have your kids ever done that to you? Oh. See, that's what we couldn't do in my house. You do that, your head's going to roll all right. But God hates that. Why? Because it's the enemy of godly greatness. Pride looks to impress and not to serve. When pride serves, it does not serve to serve. It serves to impress. Pride's obsession is with impression. The focus of a person gripped by pride is to seem to be rather than to be. I don't know how much of the stuff I have heard with people on, and, 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 no, oh, I gotta be careful how I say this. It's kind of like me when I was talking about selling or, or buying and selling property. You know, I'm just doing it for this. No, you're not. You're doing it for the money. Amen? I told you this. This is what God dealt with me. And I mentioned this last week. When you're having conversations, it's like, no, just tell the truth. It's okay. I mean, you can pretend that you're doing it to help people, but you're really doing it for the money. Right? That's how it is with God. There's people who do things, I, and, and it's like, well, it looks that way. And we joke about, well, if it looks straight, it probably is straight. How many know if you're OCD, that don't fly? No, it needs to be straight. Right? I don't want to seem to be. I want to be. I think God doesn't want us to act like he wants us to be. Pride won't actually become it or become what God has for you and that's why God hates it because pride makes me want to seem to be and not actually be pride will make us want to seem to be something but not actually be and won't let me actually do the things that actually make me be what I'm pretending to be I'm going to say that again and go a little slower pride makes me want to seem to be and not actually be what I want to be. And it won't let me do the things that actually make me be what I'm pretending to be. Like, you can wear clothing that makes you look slender. And as long as you continue to wear the clothing that makes you look slender, it will keep you from doing the things that would actually make you slender. Which cover it up, right? Tell your neighbor that's pride. I've got a friend that chides me every time I wear black. And it's online. He'll send me a text. See, you wore black. Or he'll say, was that black you had on tonight? Because it's always a contest about us losing weight. And so he'll always do that. Oh, you're wearing black. I see black makes you look slimmer. I see, yeah. I want to punch him. You understand what I'm saying? This is what pride does to us. Pride will, will come up with an excuse or will try to look a certain way. There's people who want to look fit but don't want to be fit. There's people who want to look spiritual but they don't want to do what it takes to be spiritual. There's people who want to look like they're gifted but they don't want to put the work in to actually be gifted or to be good at it or have your senses exercised in those gifts. Amen? There's people who want to act like they can preach, but they don't want to get in the Word long enough to preach. Because if you don't have anything in the tank, how many know you can't preach? You can just get up and make a lot of noise, and it might look like it for a little bit, but when the rubber meets the road, you won't, be able to have, you won't have anything to say anyway. I've done all this, so don't judge. Amen? Pride will make us do those kinds of things. It makes me pretend. I don't want to pretend. The reason God deals so harshly with pride is because it's keeping you from becoming what you're pretending to be. That's why it makes him so mad. It's like, quit faking it. You've got the goods if you just do it. I used to tell my kids that. 
You have the goods. You just need to develop them. You have the talent. You have the smarts. You have the ability. <coughs> just put in the time. Put in the work, and then you'll have it. Whatever you get in that brain, put in the education that you need in your brain, and you'll always have it there. It won't go away. But if you're not willing to put it in there, you're never going to be able to be that. It's the same thing with our life. And God doesn't just want us to just believe, and that's all we do because He said, I need you to add to your faith virtue. And then we're going to go farther than that when we quit. Will you give me 10 more minutes? If you don't, leave, and I'll talk about you. I'm just kidding. It keeps us from becoming what we're pretending to be. And I can't get away from this picture with that, that football player, that Tillman guy. There's a guy here in town who went to college with him. Knew him. They weren't close friends, but he knew him. Okay? And he said he was, he was the real deal. He didn't care what he drove. He didn't care what he wore. He was just him. He, he just, he, he be. He didn't act anything. He was tough. He did work hard. He did put in the effort. He may not have been the greatest, but he put in the effort. And he did these things. And he, he didn't do it to impress anybody. He just did it because he wanted to do it. Do you see the difference in that and how powerful that is? Versus acting like it or, or, you know, it's like even on teams with sports and things like that. The people that act like they're stretching are the people who really stretch. The people who act like they're stretching get hurt. Is that not right, Bubba? The people that want to look strong but they're not strong, there's a difference. You can blow all up or you can build all up. Amen? All of a sudden, we have all these sports injuries with these kids and stuff, and, and we can't figure out what's going on. What's wrong with these kids? What's wrong with these kids? Well, there's a difference in what they used to be, what they're doing now. There's a difference in what they're eating. There's a difference in what they're doing on their off time. There's a difference on how they're training. There's a difference on whether they're stretching or not before they train. And if they're lifting properly, if they're exercising properly, and then we're mad, we can't figure out what's wrong. All these kids getting hurt. Well, there's a reason. Pride will say, it's all right, just cover it up, tough it up, tape it up, we'll be fine. When if you would just go back and do the things, you would be tough. You would be strong. Amen? The Bible says, ah, God knows how to get you or me out of this mess of, of, the, of the pride, of the pretending, of the, of the, the, the seeming to be versus the being. Don't let your pride block his blessing. I know I have to stop. There's, we talk about good pride and bad pride. When the Bible talks about pride and the, and, and, and the, the, the bad side of pride, or biblical pride means this. It's an overinflation or estimation of one's character or contribution. Biblical pride that God hates is an overinflation or estimation of one's character or contribution. It's an inflation or estimation of how good you are and how good you and how good you are at what you do. Have you ever met somebody who thought they were really great till they got around somebody greater? You grow up in a certain area, and, man, you're the best. You're the baddest of the group in your playground or your three blocks where you growing up as a kid. I mean, I could ramp my bike when I was a kid. I thought, I, man, I had it. And then there's some neighbor kid shows up from Rancine. He's down the road a half a mile. And he's like, well, why don't we double that ramp? And I'm like, can't do that. Nobody ramps higher than that. I mean. That's, that's my record. I got this. And he's like, Psh, it's kid stuff. Tilt that bad boy up. I realized I wasn't as great as I thought I was. Amen? I mean, you know, that's pride. I, I, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And God hates that because he doesn't want you to overthink. And see, that's what's wrong with this hyper faith and hyper getting people to believe. And, and, and this sounds like I'm contradicting, but I'm not contradicting. I want people to believe that there is no limit and nothing's impossible with those 
with God, right? Who trust and believe God. But it's not going to magically happen. He wants us to, to build up into things. He wants us to work up into things. He wants us to get an education. He wants us to put in the effort, put in the time, put in the work so we can actually be it. And I'm going to prove it to you even more. God hates pride because it's destructive for you and everyone around you. The greatest enemy to our elevation is pride. So if we are going to be killing it, so to speak, we have to learn to devour the thing that devours us. And I can't help but think of John the Baptist when I heard when that phrase, when I wrote that down. You have to devour the things that are devouring you. I thought about John the Baptist. The Bible says that John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness and he was eating locusts and wild honey. What is a locust? And I begin to think, let me think of locust scriptures. I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. What is a locust? A locust is what eats up the, the crop. A, a, a locust is what, there was a, there was a chewing locust, a crawling locust, and a jumping locust. In that list of locusts that God said that he would take care of, that he would restore the years that the locusts had eaten. Isn't it amazing that John the Baptist came eating locusts? And he's the one that revealed Jesus. He's the one that come out of the wilderness and said, I'm eating the stuff that was trying to eat me. That's killing it. That's killing it. I'm killing the stuff that's trying to kill me. I'm sick of my pride. I'm sick of my fear. I'm sick of my insecurities. I'm sick of being stupid or not having the education I need. So I'm going to kill it. I'm going to go get the education. I'm sick of the way I feel. So I'm going to do something about the way I feel. I'm going to find the problem to the way I feel. I hate getting up every morning hurting all over. So I decided I'm going to do something about it. Amen? That's not cocky. That's not arrogant. That's deciding I have more in me than this, and not in a bad way, but a healthy way to say, God, if you've got something in my life that you want to do, I want to accomplish it all. I want to die empty. I want to have fulfilled it all. I want to be like the Apostle Paul that said, I have finished my course. I laid aside the sin and the weight and the sin that was be easily besetting me because I want to do this and I want to do it fully. One of the things they teach us in the program the, of, the, of the health program that I'm on is the number one thing you deal with people with is you find out the why first. Why do you want to? Why do you want to lose weight? Why do you want to get healthy? What's the reason behind it? See, that, that's, my, that's my thing with my whole life. There's a reason. God gave me a call in my life. He told me to reach people. He told me to preach this message. He told me to do these things. I want to spend time with my grandkids. I want to be able to take my grandkids fishing. I want to be able to go do things and feel good and enjoy doing it. Well, I can sit there and wish I could, pout about it, or I can do something about it. It's the same way with Christianity. It's the same way with everything about our life. God has already defeated the enemy. God has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. That means like God, right? Everybody say like God. Stay with me. It's going to get fun. I can't help but think of John the Baptist. He comes eating the locusts and wild honey. He came eating the thing that was destroying Israel that God said, I'm going to restore all that. And the very guy that comes in to introduce how that's going to be restored is eating the thing God said that he was going to restore what happened because of. I don't think that's an accident, do you? I'll restore the years the locusts had eaten. Pride stops people from learning what they need to learn to become. Pride won't let you admit that you don't know. You ever, ever been with somebody and you knew they didn't know and they just wouldn't admit it? And you're just like, if you'll just admit you don't know, I'll tell you. And they just bull around, bull around, you know, keep talking about it. Pride won't let you admit you don't know. It won't let you admit you're scared. See, because I have too much pride to admit I'm afraid. Because we've been told, fear not, don't fear, don't be afraid. But my Bible says that when I fear, I can go to him. David is the one. I looked at David's life, and I'm thinking, if he's a man after God's own heart, look at all the issues David had. But God still loved him. And he said he's a guy after my own heart. Why? Because he could just admit it. David could step in a pile of mess and turn around and repent that quick. Why? Got rid of the pride. And then I began to look at guys in Scripture. Pride won't let you admit you're scared. It won't let you admit you're confused. i got to act like i got it all together. I'm a Christian. 
I've got faith. How you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored. And I'm quivering inside because I'm about to lose my freaking mind. Because I'm, I'm all caught up in anxiety. I've got all these issues or whatever it is. I, I, we all have it of some sort. We're mad at somebody because they're addicted to alcohol and I can't quit eating fat. I had a friend that was an alcoholic, and I loved the guy. He was demon-possessed, and, and they cast the devils out of him and all this stuff. But I was going to see him one day, and I was praying, like, God, man, you've got to deliver him. we got to, all this stuff. And he said, why don't you quit drinking Diet Mountain Dew? What's that got to do with Paul? My friend's name was Paul. And it's like, mind your own business. He's got an alcohol problem. He said, yeah, well, you've got a Diet Mountain Dew problem. I was drinking five, six, eight of them a day like nothing. I mean, no, that's not healthy either. Pride keeps you from asking for help from the right people. Don't ask God for help and then be prideful with it. On who he answers it with. This happened to me this week. I cried out to God. I said, God, I got this and this and this. and this. I need to do this and this. And he showed up. And I'm like, no, anybody but them. And then I thought of the next guy I'm going to tell you about. Anybody ever heard of a guy named Saul who turned, his, turned into Paul? How many know the dude had a pride problem? Pretty big time. Paul gets blindsided by Jesus. That's not even a play on words. He's just walking down the road going to kill more Christians. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's touching the law. He was blameless. He was perfect. He was a perfect Christian. He had this zeal after God. I mean, he'd kill you if you if you'd mess it up. He'd kill you for it. I mean, that's zeal. Amen? A lot like Peter <laughs> in the beginning. And here he is just going down the road, and all of a sudden, boom, there's this great light. He hits the ground, and God speaks to him. He has a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what happened. God revealed himself to him, and it blinded him. He couldn't see. When people get a real revelation of Jesus, I know it. You know how I know? Because they don't have the answers anymore. All their doctrine goes out the window. All their theory and philosophy doesn't work anymore compared to him. And I thought, that's just like Paul. Paul had it all figured out. He gets blinded by the light. He finally sees the truth. He finally sees Jesus and, and, and the, the finished work, however you want to say it. He gets a revelation of Jesus. What's next? Humility. He can't see now. And so he has to be led by the hand. And he, he tells him, he said, I need you to go to this guy's house. And here's what humility will do for you. When you and I humble ourselves, how many know God will exalt us? Paul had to humble himself to go to Ananias' house. But Ananias also had to humble himself. Ananias was a good dude. And God speaks to Ananias and he says, Hey, uh, Saul's coming to your house. A guy named Paul, Saul. And he's like, uh, Excuse me, God. I want to be used by you. But do you understand? That would be like Saddam Hussein coming to your house. He's like, God, isn't that the guy that kills guys like me? God said, yeah, I need you to pray for him. Lay hands on him. <laughs> I don't want to lay hands on him. But Ananias had to humble himself. And Ananias humbled himself. Paul hum 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 humbled himself. <laughs> humble, humble, humble. And he gets his sight back. But that wasn't where he took off. That wasn't where Paul began his great ministry. How many know what happened? He got a revelation of Jesus. He couldn't see anything, so he had to humble himself and let somebody pray for him that he used to would have killed. He prays for him to get his sight, and now he can see, but he can't figure all this out. Everything that he had learned, everything he'd known from childhood. 
You can't fix your blindness. He was humbled. When you get humbled, you'll be sat down. Paul was knocked to the ground. Then he's blind. Then he has to be healed by somebody he would have killed. And now after he gets healed from that, where did Paul go after that? He went and hid for three years. Disappeared. Why? He'd been humbled. God had great plans for Paul. God was going to write two-thirds of the New Testament with Paul. Paul was the guy that we were all going to preach for the next 2,000 plus years about the whole new covenant. He's the guy that got the revelation of grace. He's the one we all preach the grace from. He's the guy that went from law to grace. But he gets a revelation of Jesus, and the next thing he does is he disappears for three years. Why? He said he went off into the mountains, and he said, I was taught by no one save the Holy Ghost. He wasn't around anybody else. Why? Because he said, I, I, I want God to teach me. I'm going to humble myself. I'm not going to tell God what I know. I'm just going to sit and wait for God to teach me now. I think he spent a lot of quiet time. And what did he do? He was humbled himself. And when he come back out of that, how many know he didn't know as much as he thought when he went in? And so he humbles himself. And when he came out to be, he became great. Then he was. He thought he was before. But he said, everything that I thought I knew, everything that I acted like, to look important or to be in right standing with God. I count all that as dung. He humbled himself. God humbled him first. See, because whoever exalts himself, Paul was exalting himself. So God humbled him. And then Paul went ahead and submitted and humbled himself before God. And then God made him great. I'm just here to tell you today, it's never too late. Even if you've been full of pride your whole life and you, and you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is me. The good news is all we got to do is just humble ourselves. God's plan's still the same. Amen? God said, now I can make you great, Paul. Humbleness, humility is a virtue. Add to your faith virtue. Stay hidden. Try not to tell anybody if you see a miracle. If you pray for somebody and God heals them, I dare you not to tell anybody. As long as you can. Because the more you stay humbled and the more you try to hide and the more, and it's not to get ahead. No, that's not it. That's not the goal, see, because that's working the system. No, just, just try not to be seen. I told Cassie, I said, I'm getting under conviction. I'm almost to turn that camera off. And tell people, if you want to come here, come here. If you can't, then go find you a church somewhere and be there. Quit sitting at home and watching on a camera. And I understand there's people that can't get here. And for those, I, I get that. And that's the only reason that thing's still on. And I, that's not, it's just, I, I've never wanted to that. I've I, we, we, I got to get off that one. Now go back, if you would, Kendra, to Second Peter 1. I'm going to go back to where we started, and we're going to go a little further because I want you to see this progression, and, and I'll let you go. There's a few more verses here. Second Peter 1, 5 says, But also for this very reason. Can, can you get four? I'm, we did five. That's fine. For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. So if you think it's bad now, we're dealing with virtue and all this stuff we've got to add to virtue. We've got to start with honor, and now we've got to be humbled, and we're going to do four more weeks of this on virtue. Then we're going to go to knowledge. I'm just following the commas. Yeah, i got faith, but add to your faith virtue, then knowledge, then to knowledge, our favorite one, self-control. Then to self-control, let's add perseverance. It's time to execute. It's time for us to be Christians because when you be a Christian, you have all the goods. You don't just look like you got the goods. And then when the rubber meets the road, it's kind of like driving a... I won't say it. The wrong kind of truck. 
and you hook on to a trailer and you need to pull it and you ain't got the guts to pull it. That's what this whole Christianity thing is. To knowledge add self-control. To self-control add perseverance. To perseverance now add some more godliness. <laughs> Great. Talk about works. <laughs> Stay with me. To good godliness brotherly kindness. <laughs> now I got to be nice to people. On top of all this other stuff, I just got added to my faith. And to brotherly kindness, now i got to love them. Keep going. For if these things are yours and abound, that means they're, they're, they're going on in you. You're killing it. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep going. For he who lacks these things that I just listed, add virtue, knowledge, all this stuff. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to, uh-oh, there's where Paul was, blindness. And has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, execute. To make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That does not mean getting to heaven someday and there will be a big door especially for you in heaven. That means an opportunity into the kingdom and to operate and live in the kingdom now. Do you see how weak and anemic we are as Christians today? Myself included. That's not to put heavy burdens on you. That's not what it is. Because we started, because if you remember, he started that verse with God's already given you all this. It's in you. You just need to develop it. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. He's already given it. You've got to stir up the gift within you. You've got to do the things necessary. Let him have his work and his way in your life. Let him give you perseverance. Let him help you be nice and kind and to love people. And let him let you be, you need to be humble. I need to be humble. We need to honor people. We need to be the full package, amen? Otherwise, we're going to get the rug yanked out from under us, and we're going to look really stupid. And we're touting Christianity and how great God is, but yet we can't even hold our tongue. We're touting how great God is and He's in me and I can do all things, but I can't keep from doing this and I can't keep from doing that. And you with me? The power's in you. I just want to lay my hands on everybody and stir up the gift within you because the gift is Him. It's in you. That Holy Spirit needs to stir up within all of us and we start adding this stuff and say, I don't do this to be seen. I don't want to be seen. And, and, and I'm using this just because I'm doing it. Please, I'm not, I don't want any attention for this. My health, I'm doing this because I want to be healthy. I want to feel good. When I get up in the morning, I want to feel good. I want to live. I want to go build something and work on something again. Because I have been so long that way, I didn't even want to get out of bed anymore. I had no drive to do anything. I'm fighting depression. I'm fighting all this stuff. And all as it is, is I needed to get my health in track. I needed to give my body the things that my body needed. And my body did the miracle. Tell somebody that will preach. That's what's wrong with the body of Christ. God told me. He spoke that to me. He said, you know, if you give the body what the body needs, the body will do miracles without exercise. It's amazing to me. It's all right there. This is why I'm preaching this way. This is where we're going to be this year. Because why? I'm going to give you the things your body needs. I'm going to give us the thing this Christian body needs so we can be the real deal and we can be great. Really, really great. For real. Amen? Don't you want to be great? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. 
And I thank you that it's not heavy. You said my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. God, help us not to buy into the lie that the enemy has told us that being godly is hard. Or that, that being patience, having patience is bad. Having patience is a virtue that you've already given us. God, that, that honoring people that are hard to honor, that's not hard for us because you're the one that, that gave us the ability to honor those people. Every virtue, God, you've already given us to life. Help us to believe that. And out of that, we'll come, it will just be easy. It will just be natural. It will be a yoke that is not heavy, but it's a burden that's light. And we will walk out our purposes and our destinies in our life. We will have good, strong, healthy marriages and relationships and our children. And our children will be healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually. We will be the real deal. We won't just be super spiritual or super healthy or super emotional. God, we will be the whole thing, body, soul, and spirit like you designed us to be. And we will be great to glorify and honor you. And I pray that for this church. I pray that for this nation. I thank you for humbling us. I thank you for yanking the rug out from underneath us. I thank you for speaking truth and life to us through your word and through your people. God, mold me and make me whatever you want me to be. I submit. I humble myself before you. And I give you praise because your promises are all yes and amen. And we say amen. In Jesus' name, amen.